and they would ask uh, for him to pray for family members or whatnot, uh, because they knew that he was taking church seriously. He was born at a time in Russia where there wasn't a lot of piety going around. Uh, and it was on the eve of the revolution, maybe about 20 years before, uh, not 20 years, what am I talking about? You know, it was, it was the time before the revolution. And basically, uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of examples of piety. Uh, St. John was a slow learner in school, uh, literally the slowest kid in the class from what I've read. And uh, one day he fell on his knees and prayed uh, and things, his mind opened up. He said it was a veil that had, like a veil that had fallen from my eyes. He has become uh, the saint of, of uh, the patron saint of those who struggle in school. Uh, from that time, he wasn't a, he wasn't the type of kid, a uh, student that w that didn't excel. He excelled after that. Uh, for some reason, uh, the Lord graced him with the ability to overcome his challenges. He finished his school in the roles of the seminary. Uh, at the seminary, he dreamed about being a, a missionary in China. But he saw that his own country needed help. He saw that really uh, his, his own country literally needed to be remissionized. Russia, uh, in the year 1088, became an Orthodox country. The, the, literally, the, the, uh, the king at the time uh, made Orthodoxy the country of the, the, the religion of the people. And so uh, from that time, in 1988, by the way, while Russia was still coming out of communism, they did they celebrated a thousand years of orthodoxy, which is really interesting. But at the time that um, he was around, where he was growing up and as a young man, he saw that there was a need for people to re-orthodox themselves. He got married after his graduation from the seminary. He got ordained as deacon and a priest shortly thereafter. Uh, as a priest, he said, I made myself the rule of being as sincere as possible in my work and strictly watching my inner life. He serves as the priest in Kronstadt. That's where you get St. John of Kronstadt. Um, they don't go by his last name. He, he is uh, synonymous with a particular uh, place, like St. Demetrius is, is uh, synonymous with Thessaloniki. Saint uh, Nicarius of Aegina. Some saints are so beloved by particular areas of the world that they literally are tied to the area that they minister to. As a priest, he conducted the services daily and offered prayers for the faithful. By the 1890s, he's known as a miraculous healer. Thousands, this is not a misprint, thousands came to visit him every day. Saint John, by the way, never had kids. He in his biography, this is kind of somewhat controversial by people. Uh, in his biography, it says that him and his wife agreed to live like brother and sister. Uh, and they didn't have kids. They didn't have relations. Um, there was a story where a bishop ordered him not to live like brother and sister. He ordered him to at least try to have kids with his wife. And the story is that for three days, the bishop couldn't speak. Uh, in other words, it was, it was almost like God's will for them to be together as, as husband and wife, but not to have kids. Uh, and after the three days that Bishop uh, regained his ability to speak. Uh, let's see. The government at that time when he was in Kronstadt exiled murderers, thieves, and other criminals to Kronstadt. St. John spent hours in basements and dugouts ministering to these people. Not, not uh, the ideal people, right? But he ministered to everybody. He concerned himself with the lives of the poor, especially. Oftentimes, he would return home uh, barefoot and without his cassock because he had given those things away. Uh, that's how much he cared about the poor. In 1857, he began teaching in local city schools. He would tell people, if children cannot listen to the gospel, it is only because it's taught like any other subject with without with him with indifference in 18 let me let me turn this off in 1883 16 people report the miraculous healing powers of saint john 
and they write about it in the newspaper. Uh, and his fame grows from there. His, uh, you know, what we say, uh, God makes sanctity known, right? And, and St. Seraphim Sarov says, this is a good example. St. Seraphim Sarov says, if you acquire the Holy Spirit, thousands among you will be saved. Well, this one priest was literally meeting with hundreds of people. They said thousands of people were visiting him, but he literally was, he became very popular in his time. And, and for those who wonder sometimes about how do we declare saints, usually you get a good idea before, the church has a, wonder, a good idea before the saint dies that this person was holy because of the testimonies of the people. Tsar Alex, the Tsar of Russia in 1894, summons him on his deathbed for prayers. That's how popular St. John was. Kronstadt is not like one of the big cities of, of, uh, of, of uh, Russia, but uh, his fame led even to the Tsar. And uh, he, was, he was there for the last moments of the Tsar's life, the last days. The Tsar died of uh, kidney failure. And St. John said um, something to the effect of, I, I've raised uh, people from the dead and I couldn't help this man. Uh, it must have been God's will. He dies on the 20th of December, 1908, having foretold his death. He's canonized by Rokor in 1964. For those who don't know, after during the revolution, uh, when the communist regime took place, they would put spies in the churches. And so the Patriarchate of Moscow, uh, among the other patriarchates, people didn't know for sure if Soviet representatives were, were taking part in the church. So they formed a Russian Orthodox church outside of Russia. That's what Rokor stands for, Ro Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. They represented Russia that was not infiltrated by the enemy, by the, by the communists. Anyway, they, they have since reconciled, since communism is no longer uh, taking place. But in 1964, Rokor, outside of Russia, recognized him as a saint. 1990, it wasn't until 1990, when Russia was coming out of communism, where the Patriarch of Moscow uh, declared him a saint. Remember, Rokor and Moscow, the Patriarchate, in 1990, were not together. Uh, they, they didn't come together until years later. Now, 60 new churches were built in his honor all over Russia. This is how beloved he is to so many of the people. He was literally uh, a shining light in an encroaching area of uh, time of darkness for them. Interesting aspects of St. John's life. He introduced the practice of frequent communion and confession. He said, the longer we remain without confession, the worse it is for us. And, and this is something that parallels uh, in the Orthodox Church, in the Greek Church also. I know that my parents' generation, the, uh, the service of holy unction was really considered to be good enough as a confession because uh, it, in those prayers, God, the priest is asking for God to forgive them. And confession up until, I don't know, a few decades ago, wasn't very popular uh, in, in, our, in our church here in America. And in my father's generation, it wasn't a popular thing unless you did something really, really bad. In terms of regular confession, that was kind of out of the norm. But St. John brought that back into practice. Uh, the longer we remain without confession, the worse it is for us. And even today, if you go to a Russian church, uh, I went to a Russian church before I was a priest and I was approached and uh, they, had, they had asked me uh, on a Sunday, to, before I took communion, they had asked me, did you, uh, did you take confession yesterday. I mean, some of the churches are very strict with this idea of taking confession as a way to prepare for communion. So St. John brought that back into play. With respect to education, he focused on articulation. In other words, how do you present something? It's good enough that you know it, but are you teaching it in such a way that uh, the person is like encouraged to learn it, you know? And, and that's one of, one of his criticisms when he saw religious education of the day. I put this quote up, teaching a 75% presentation, 25% content. Somehow, some way, the way you present it has to catch the student's eyes. And that's what he kind of stressed there. St. John had his admirers called the Ioannites, named after, like in American English, you would say the Johnites, right? 
they were dedicated members of St. John who, who had particular beliefs uh, that worked against St. John. You know, uh, They believed that the end of the world would come, which would take place after the revolution. They believed they could find salvation through St. John, which is kind of a heretical. Salvation comes through Christ. But many times what you find with holy people, uh, and, and, and we've seen this recently, right, that it's the people next to the holy person that the devil uses to tarnish that person's image, okay? Uh, and so that kind of happened with St. John, uh, that these people, they were kind of, I call it spiritual immaturity. Uh, here they're in the presence of a holy person, and they want to they wanna be with that holy person so badly because there's something of God in that person, and that immaturity pops out in particular places. Uh, uh, St. John wrote a book, My Life in Christ. It's a very popular book. I have that downstairs. Um, he also wrote a book on the priesthood. He used to write to the local newspaper. I don't know if I've seen the, the articles, but in his biography, it says that he wrote to the, the, the local newspaper in Russia. His constant thought was how he would come before the last judgment and have to give an account not only of his own deeds, but also on the deeds of his own flock for whose education and salvation he was responsible. This is the, this is the, uh, the burden of the priest, right? That, that he's in charge of conditioning and, and setting up and, and a particular culture in the parish that promotes the furthering of the Orthodox faith. Uh, and so uh, through his prayers, through God's intercessions, the people kind of fall into play and, and, and go through that. But that is, uh, that is an awesome thing to do. I find that when you're on your prayer life, the prayers themselves remind you that there, you will be judged one day, that nothing is given in everyday life to take every day and make it sacred. Um, and that was his approach. To him, no one was a stranger. Everyone came to him for help and became a friend and relative. Uh, we can't neglect the poor. Uh, many times... I, I was actually approached, uh, I remember one time, by someone who said, uh, someone closer to said, Father, there's a homeless person in the, in, the, in the parking lot asking for money. Can you tell them to leave? And I, and I told this person, it's not, who are we to tell them to leave? St. John Chrysostom would somehow bring them into the church. And that's, that's our job. You know, we, we, we have to cater to the least of these because the least of these might be Christ, right? Um, he foresaw, he was a kind of a, he, he foresaw events coming up. He foresaw, as a true prophet, the revolution of 1917. He unsparingly rebuked the growing apostasy among the people. He foretold that the very name of Russia would be changed. Um, and as we know, that, that, that happened. And lastly, he, he did the practice of daily services. And that is something that the church in America has gotten away from. Uh, if I remember there was a church, there was a priest from Greece. Uh, he would try to do services every day in America. And one of the criticisms was he's a, he's a halftime priest. And I said, why? And he said, because he doesn't do the other ministries like Goya and Junior Goya and this or that. And uh, the remark was in Greece, he would be, that's, that's what they do. They do the services and there's not as many ministries here. But it's just a different approach here. But St. John's approach was to do the, the daily services and to offer prayers every single day. Um, I think St. Nicholas of Planas, every day that he was a priest, uh, for decades he did services. He did the divine liturgy. So anyway, the, these are some of the high points of this remarkable life of St. John of Kronstadt. I tried to, let me see if I can exit this to stop sure. I tried to find um, I tried to find a uh, a picture of him. I thought I did. Uh, I don't know if I can share it. Let me see. Uh, yeah, I don't think I could share it. Yeah, I don't think I could share it. Anyway. Those are some of the strong points of St. John of Cronstead. At this point, why don't we open it up to people, doctor? Okay. And uh, can you unmute yourselves? I don't see the doc. There it is. 
Oh, here. This is the this is the picture of Saint John of Kronstadt uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Okay. Can you guys talk? I have a question. You said yeah. it was outside of Russia. Where did they go? The church was outside of Russia during communism. We know that. Um, we know that. Yes, Sarandi. You're on I mute. Can, you're on mute. I'll mute yourself. You can. can you unmute yourself? In the bottom left, bottom right. Can you unmute Sarandi? Um, well, all I can do. Is okay. Yeah. yeah. From what from what I remember yeah. is that when. Go ahead, Doc. When the yeah. when the when the revolution happened, Helen, the Patriarch of Moscow sent a group of bishops and uh, monks out and said go go and serve the flock go and serve the flock and they became the russian church outside of russia r-o-c-o-r -O rokor rokor and now for example now 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 in the state of illinois they have the cathedral in des Plaines. they have the chapel by you have you been to it at the camp saint vladimir's cap in rockford yeah outside of rockford there's a church i know Rockfall. They have an English, and they have an English-speaking church in um, Carroll Stream, Mer Warrenville. Interesting. So, are they all in America then, or no, no surrounding countries? No, all over the world. All, all over the world. Oh, they went everywhere. everywhere. I was wondering where they went. Yeah, uh, and there's some. Oh, okay. And there's some areas in New York State. Yeah. And they're and they're all over the world, and then. Like 10, 15 years ago, more like 15 years ago, they um, reconciled, right? Yeah, around nine, about around 2000, around 2000, they reunited. They united with Moscow. They Patriot united King. because of the Serbians. The Serbian Church united them. Is that Maria? Yes. No, thank you, Maria. Oh. Thank you for the... the Serbian Church united them. You know, there was a, there was a story that I heard from uh, one of the professors at, at the seminary. It kind of gave me chills. There was a man who was part of the communist army in Russia, and he was sent by the government to be ordained and to serve in the church, but to spy for the church, for the government, and to kind of pretend you're our priest, but you're, you're a pretend priest. And he didn't believe in God, okay? Anyway, he was served as a priest for like 10 years, and he got out of it, whatever. In his 80s, he walks into a church, and the priest at this church in Russia, uh, he comes out, and he goes, excuse me, is there a priest here? And everyone's looking around, and he's like, well, he's not talking about me. I mean, you know, I was, I was undercover, so nothing happens. Two minutes later, the priest comes out again. Is there a priest here? Nothing. Nobody says anything. One more time, he says, is there a Father John? And then he names this guy's last name. And the guy goes, he raises his hand. He goes, come back here. And he comes back and he says, I could not do the liturgy because the angel, because he asked him, how'd you know my last name? How'd you know my name? He goes, there's an angel back here in the altar who said, you cannot do the liturgy unless this priest, Father John, whatever, joins you. And, and that's what happened. Apparently at the end of his life, this communist uh, who became a priest really started to change his opinions and really started to believe, uh, believe in God and in the faith. Anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, reminder of, of the stuff that they went through, you know. Thank you, Father. Thank you. There's so many beautiful stories. Hello. Mir like beautiful, beautiful miracles. Beautiful yeah. miracles and signs, miracles and signs. I like the fact how Ted brought this up earlier today. He struggled in school. I think that's a that's a nice lesson for people. And, and how do you 
how do you respond when you struggle in school, right? To to rely on on, on God's grace to open open your mind, you know. As long as you're trying to rely on God's grace to to help, you know. God God saw his weakness and he helped him. Did did Doctor, can you unmute everybody? Yeah, everybody's unmuted except for. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah, everybody's for the unmuted. Confession. Okay. Yes, doctor. For the confession, was he the first one to start? No, for confession. No, yes. no, 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 no. It was always a part of the the, the confession. From what I understand, the, you're talking about confession in general, right, Doctor Nika? Uh, in in church. Because yeah. yeah in, in general okay so in the beginning i believe it started more formally in the fourth century because they say that the church exploded it spread so fast in the fourth century that you needed to go to confession because not everybody got it down the right way it was like spreading so fast uh because there was a great flowering of the church that as as the quantity the number of people increased we the church had to make sure that the quality was there too and so that's why in the fourth century two things happened as the as the miracles were happening and people were spreading and becoming christians the monasticism started spreading and that helped uh keep the church the people in check a little bit and confession the idea of having a spiritual guide also started so we know that around the fourth century it became uh, a more formal thing. And it, in the early church, people confessed by standing up and just in front of others confessing their sins. Uh, and that has changed. It's become more private since then, obviously, more one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, there's ebbs and flows, you know, like there was a period in our church where confession was not stressed as much. Uh, and, and I want to say that was like 100 years ago. It wasn't the idea of having a, a spiritual father, a father confessor. It was not uh, spread as much. It wasn't apparent. But it is something that is a big part of our history. Not everything translates when it comes to different countries, right? So even in Russia, it was there for a thousand years almost. And it, the practice of confession kind of wasn't, uh, wasn't as strong. Many times people would go to confession once a year, not often, you know. Well, we would only take communion like four times a year. That too. Yeah, those sacraments too, right. right. And, and when you talk to them, they would say, well, if you take it too often, you're going to lose this idea of how special this is. And, our, and our, our response is, you know, you're always progressing towards God and you're, we're so broken and we need constant communion uh, to progress, to get unstuck, you know. Did it, yeah, did, go ahead. The, did the text did the text mention what a very difficult environment he was being that it was a seaport and all the riffraff? Yeah. And um, why why, for example, it said that there were there were criminals that there were people that were exiled and they lived there in that city? Say it again. Say it again. There were people. There were people. There were people exiled, and they lived in that city. Right. Like uh, Siberia. We can barely oh. hear you. But like Siberia. Hold on, guys. One second. Can you hear me now? You can hear me or no? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I can't hear you guys as much. I don't know what happened. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why they, they, they did that in that country. Uh, it was like sending people to Siberia. I wonder, Father, are there from 30 years ago till now, 
other than those two books, those two books of Father of St. John, those two books of St. John of Kronstadt, have more, th have more things been translated? No, those are the only ones that I know of. How about, how about the two ladies? Do, are you able to read, read Serbian? I, no, I speak it. I don't read it well. Christy, do you read, do you read, you frequently read in Serbian? Me? No. No, no. she's Albanian. She's Albanian. I don't oh. know Serbian. <laughs> oh, my goodness. She's Albanian. I'm Serbian. I wish you had some maculore. I'm, I need some maculore. <laughs> <laughs> I just asked her, just asked her for ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Bear with me one second, guys. I'm, I'm trying to work on my... Christy, Christy, when I was in school in Greece, my two closest friends, one was from Berati. Okay. And the other one was from Koritsa. Oh, very good. My grandma was from Berati. Oh, and they both, they both ended up living in Greece and they married Greek women. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and they have a phenomenal, a phenomenal work ethic. <laughs> Thank you. Did you guys read his vision? Yeah, I did. That's kind of scary, isn't it? <laughs> it, was, it was so detailed, though. That's it was, what. <laughs> it was very detailed. But what, very... Were all the, what were all those years? Obviously, the 1917 was the revolution. But what were all, there were quite a few years there that the Sterix was telling him that, you know, had etched and engraved in the wood. Yeah, I, I, I had the same thinking that you did, you know? Like, maybe, maybe that's a way of expressing oneself in, a, in Russian, colloquially. I don't know. I'll ask my Russian friends. Didn't really explain what all those different years were. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know, that's just... Uh... You know, it, it was almost like God sent St. John to these people to strengthen them for the upcoming difficulties that they were going to have. I mean, like the number of martyrs that came out of Russia during that time, during that period, you know, and just maybe knowing someone who was in contact with St. John or, or knowing St. John as a kid, you know, just maybe that gave them that that strength to become martyrs. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason why he came along at that time. It's, a, it's an interesting, uh, he has a very interesting life. Sure saw a lot of things, boy. <laughs> yeah. Does it, that was a lot. Has any, see now this question, everything, nothing's translated, but um, I'm wondering if he has like great nieces and nephews that are clerics, that are priests, monks, or nuns. But what about then, him? But if he had great, pre, great, great nieces and nephews that became monks and nuns, but then he didn't live in his hometown. He was he was sent somewhere far away, so he went. You know, he wasn't with them. They didn't grow up with him. Right. Well, that's interesting. I don't know. Did he have brothers and sisters? That's not know. clear. I, I know, like, a, I think, like, his niece wrote a recollection, a memoir of him. Uh, but to have hundreds of people visiting you every day, you know, that's just, uh, and, and maybe that was part of God's plan, not to have kids, you know. Oh, that's right. So he can have time for the people. Yeah, he would have time for the people. You know. But he was known throughout his land. 60 churches built in his honor. You know. That's a lot. He died in December. I thought his feast day 
Let me look it up really quick. I thought it was the 19th. Oh, so it's this month. Yeah, hold on. What? What? I forgot in my church. I forgot in the church calendar. What? What big holidays are coming up? When Saint Nicholas? Saint Nicholas? December sixth. December sixth. December sixth. What about um, the archangels Michael and Gabriel and Saint Nectarios? Saint no, Nectarios is November ninth, and the angels are the eighth. Okay, November. Because I know on the tenth, on the tenth of November is my dad Orestes, and also Saint Arsenios. They were both from Cappadocia. Saint Arsenios Ar was the one who baptized uh, Paisios, right? Saint yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Saint John of Cronstadt has two feast days: December twentieth, oh. when he died, and October nineteenth. Mm. He was born on October nineteenth. Mm -hmm. But he's not on the church calendar. He's not on the church calendar. Is that because he, no? Is that because he was Russian? Yeah, could be. Yeah, there's so many saints every day. Yeah. So many saints every day. They put the ones at the.